hustle and bustle with the chairs. Um, I'm Peyton Weaver. I'm the president of the club Faith United with Science and Engineering. And um, I just want to welcome you guys here tonight. So welcome. Um, just a note as far as uh, FUSE is concerned. FUSE, our whole purpose of our um, club is to provide students with a space to grapple with these, uh, with the interdiction of faith and science. And so that's what we're doing tonight with Dr. Stanford. Um, he's presenting a perspective on uh, his story. And I pray that we, that we will come into it with um, an open mind, open hearts as we listen to him. So just one other note, um, if you're interested in being in a leadership position in FUSE, we will need someone to step up for next semester because I'm graduating this semester. So if you're interested in leadership, you can email, um, email me, Weaver P. Uh, I'm going to be passing around the attendance sheet, so if everyone will sign into the attendance. If you're a community member, please sign your name, just so that we have a count of how many. Just sign it on one of the backs of the sheets of paper. So, yeah, thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. So pray with me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for being with us here tonight. Thank you for uh, revealing yourself to us through your word and through the works of your hand, creation. I pray that we will, um, each of us will be humble and open-minded as we listen to what Dr. Stanford has for us. I pray that uh, his words will teach us and spur growth in our lives, Lord. Thank you for who you are and uh, that we have the freedom to have uh, meetings like this at John Brown. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So, thank you for coming all tonight. Dr. John Sanford, who is with us today, is a population geneticist who has taught at Cornell and invented the biological process, the quote, gene gun a widespread method used in horticultural genetic research. You can find some of this material on logosresearchassociates.org. John has published over 80 scientific publications and has been granted over 30 patents. His most significant scientific contributions involve three inventions, the biologic gene gun process, the pathogen-derived re resistance, and genetic immunization. A large fraction of the transgenic crops, in terms of numbers of acreage, grown in the world today were genetically engineered using the gene gun technology developed by John and his collaborators. John wrote a book called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, discussing the implications of the accumulation of genetic mutations and the limitations of natural selection to reverse the process and prevent genetic meltdown. John also leads development of computer software Mendel's Accountant, one of the most accurate numerical simulations of evolutionary uh, population genetics. John was formerly an atheist and is currently a Christian, and so he has perspectives from both viewpoints from which to facilitate discussion on matters of science and faith. Those who are interested in talking further with Dr. Sanford can get together for an informal breakfast tomorrow at 8 a.m. in the cafeteria. So, would you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jan John Sanford. <laughs> Proceedings of that symposium are here, 
and uh, that's, that's something for your Canberra University, uh, both genetic entropy, which, um, which I'll be describing. And then uh, the, the big green book is something that you could read if you have six months. It's extremely technical, <laughs> and, uh, and, and each chapter is a different field of science, so none of us can understand all the chapters. So this is the synopsis you can read in a few hours. It captures the highlights from that. Okay, uh, sorry, I walked away from the mic, probably nobody heard me back there. Um, if, I tend to be self-spoken, so just wave if you can't hear, okay, because uh, that'll help me out a lot. My computer can find to go to sleep, so we'll try to wake it up. Um, if you want to know more about me, uh, you can go to geneticentropy.org, and this website has um, a lot of information, uh, including under here references, and so a lot of the papers I'm going to be discussing uh, tonight are, you can go to that, this link and click on any one of these technical papers and read it without having to, uh, without any um, pain or suffering. Okay, so we're going to close that out. We're going to make this big. And I'd just like to tell a little bit more about myself. Thanks, Dante, for introducing me. Um, and um, when I was in high school, I loved science. I, just, I still love science. I'm 66 years old, and I still love science. But the science that I learned in high school persuaded me that evolution is true, and that evolution was a proof against God. And so, before I was graduated from high school, I was a strongly committed uh, evolutionist and had abandoned any notions of God. And so, um, I know that Darwin impacted my life. And I believe Darwin has impacted uh, hundreds of millions of lives. In fact, I believe it's honest and accurate to say Darwin is the great, greatest atheist maker of all time. So it's in that light that I feel talking about Darwin, not bashing him, but critically examining his thesis is very, very important, especially for the Christian community. So um, I was saved when, um, actually, I've been at Cornell for my whole career. Uh, I've been Cornell professor for 36 years, but um, I invented something called the gene gun that doesn't take early retirement. So I retired at age 50 uh, and have been for the last 15 years uh, devoting my time to continuing to do genetic research, but to do genetic research that's, that it addresses issues of scripture and evolution. So that's one of the things I want to present to you tonight is my research. So I'm presently, I'm still, uh, I have a courtesy position at Cornell. A courtesy position means they don't pay you if I don't have to work. So <laughs> that works out okay for me. I can still publish as a Cornell professor. Um, I am involved in three different areas of ministry. Um, I'm the director of a Russia Christie Club, which is a little bit like a Fuse Club, uh, at a university near where I live. And uh, I'm president of a small foundation, Feed My Sheep Foundation, where, which is going to, has done a lot of the research that I've been reporting. And then I'm president of Logos Research Associates, which is a network of scientists, Christians, and people who are defending a creation perspective, using their science to do so. And so uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, Here's a diagram I'd like to spend a few minutes with. Um, actually, I didn't include this, and actually it's going to mean that all my tech, some 10 minutes of my technical stuff is going to fall off the edge of the table, because I realized I really wanted to address this in light of what Fuse is about. And so uh, I would like to, uh, so this diagram to me gives us a big picture in terms of, I have to stay near the mic, don't I? Okay. So, um, there are six views of origins, and I know because I've held five of them. 
<laughs> and uh, so the six views, the traditional view is the young earth creation. So many of you know that's called yak. So if, you, if someone calls me a yak, I say I'm not offended because they just mean that I'm a young earth creation. So uh, an example of that would be Dr. Henry Morris. Uh, thank you. Good. That's a, that's a hint, meaning I should be louder, too. Okay. Um, these, these are initials of, uh, of highly recognized scientists, and these are categories of belief. So uh, this is the view that has traditionally been held. It's based upon just reading scripture, face value, and accepts Genesis 1 through 11 as history. And so um, that, that is the view I've come to. Uh, I, I hold that position humbly, and I don't beat anybody over the head saying they have to agree with me, but that's where I've come to in my, in my walk. And so um, I do believe one distinctive of this is this is the only position where this is the only uh, foundation where you can explain if God is good, why is there death, suffering, parasites? and all the nastiness we see in the biological world. And so, um, and so the young earth creation is tied to a miraculous creation and a biblical flood and a literal fall. All that happens in the first few chapters of the Bible, which is a lot to really hard stuff to believe. Um, although I'm going to be presenting uh, genetic research that supports these two categories. The next category is OEC. Now, if I call someone in this room OEC, I'm not insulting them. I'm just saying that they are an old Earth creationist. They don't believe in Darwinian process, but they do believe the Earth is old and the thing started with the Big Bang. And so Hugh Ross is the primary uh, advocate of that position in the world today. And this group uh, is. Um, insists that the evidence for an old earth is so compelling that they, that, that, and that there's not much lost by going to that position. So I respect that position, and uh, I, for a short period of time, did hold that position. Theistic evolution is the next category, and I think it's pretty obvious what theistic evolution is. It's, it's um, acknowledging God, but saying God did it through evolution. I was here for about 10 years after being saved. And I, what I realized is there, this group is very, there's a very sharp division within this group. And that is uh, Michael Dehe, as an example, of theistic evolutionists who believe that God helped evolution. He was actually in the process, excuse me, and that he, uh, he's helping it along. So he says, things are designed, God made things progressively, but they're of, of, they have design, they're not due to simply natural process. Whereas Francis Collins, whoop, I've been pushing the wrong buttons, there we go. Um, Francis Collins would be the most famous example of a person who believes in uh, natural process only. So the last miracle in terms of creation would have been the Big Bang, and everything else was natural process. And so we are the product of uh, natural selection and survival of the fittest. And so um, that's, these two points of view basically uh, are sharply at, at odds because one acknowledges that things, when we study things in nature, they look designed and they seem like they have a maker. Whereas these people would say they're only designed as in the sense that nature itself, natural process was designed. So this is, these are the, the, the theistic positions, and then there's a red line, which is where we jump into the atheistic positions. And there's actually more than one level of atheism, and so the first level is what I call romantic evolutionists. So before I was a theistic evolutionist, I was a romantic evolutionist. Now what is a romantic evolutionist? Well, it's easier to explain if I study the next one. It's hardcore evolution. Hardcore, okay, Carl Sagan was a famous advocate of romantic evolution. Will Provine, a famous atheist at Cornell, 
was a, a famous advocate of hardcore evolution. And Will Provine taught this. He said, uh, evolution's not going anywhere. It's a meaningless process. We have no meaning. We have no significance. We are just a bag of molecules. People are no better than mosquitoes. There is no rational basis for uh, morality. And when we're dead, we're dead. And he was very, uh, you know, he didn't equivocate on what he felt, if evolution is true, where to take us. Whereas Carl Sagan would say, yes, evolution is true, and it's all natural process, and there is no God. But it's wonderful, and it's leading to more and more beautiful things like us, and we're on our way to evolving into something more wonderful still. So, um, so basically, this is like, there's a hidden purpose behind evolution, although there's no being or intelligence behind it, and yet it's somehow going somewhere wonderful, whereas this is just, evolution means uh, everything's just, you know, <coughs> pretty meaningless. The last category, and I heard Will say this to his students in one lecture, he said, don't go here. This is a nihilism, and I suppose Nietzsche would be a good example. These folks basically uh, are inclined to self-destruct. And before they do, they will often go to school with a gun and take down other people with them. Because for them, if this is true, then it means life is just a really bad joke. And so these are the six positions, and it represents an incredible spectrum. And so I started out here, and then later I went here, and here, and here, and here. So, the only place I didn't go is here. And of course, you know I didn't do that because I'm here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so when you've been wrong this much, it makes you humble. See, I've been wrong most of the time. <laughs> Whichever position here is true, I've most of my life spent believing the other, the other, the other truths, other claims. I just wonder if everyone here can identify for yourself, which category you're in. I, I think you should, I'm, I'd be surprised if anyone here is not clear on where you are in this. So just think about it. If I call on you, I want you to tell me. I'm not going to tell you. But if I did, I, I trust you to tell me which, where, which group you're at. Or maybe you're struggling between two different uh, categories. So, um, my testimony is this. Um, this. This was a bad place for me. And it, my life was really messed up. And, I, and for me, this isn't like, this, this magic red line isn't the issue. This is a spectrum in my, to my way of thinking. And uh, as I moved this way, I was moving from darkness to light. And, I, and in retrospect, I can see that really clearly. And that, does, that mean I dis does that mean I disrespect everybody else? No. That was my experience. And so I, became, I came to know the Lord more as I believed him more. So scripture says, Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him as righteousness in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, that's repeated four or five times. It's an important concept. God wants us to believe him. And that's, that's how I landed over here with all the crazies, crazy mixed up people who don't buy Darwin and actually believe that it's a young earth. I took quite a bit of my technical stuff uh, and left it out so I could just give you that bigger picture. Um, I hope it's useful. And it's not a slam on anybody, it's, it's just kind of my experience. Most people here probably have changed their position here. Certainly I did. But I know people who started here and went to here and here. And I, one of them told me, he's right over here somewhere, he said, I'm not an atheist yet. And I, I pray that he comes back to a more, uh, that he comes away from that uh, edge. So, I'd like to just quickly, quickly, meaning an hour, uh, <laughs> in as little time as I know how, I'm going to give you some interesting information. Uh, evidence for and evidence against. Okay, so we have, there's two questions, and um, like everything, you have to consider both sides, don't you? So in terms of Christian apologetics, 
We're always looking at, by the way, why do we need Christian apologetics? Well, maybe not here on this campus, because everybody's safe and sound. But if you're on a secular campus, students, are, their faith is attacked daily. Every single day, their faith is mocked and ridiculed and from the lecture, from the students. So if we can't defend them, we, we'd better learn how to defend our faith, or we will lose our faith. Most young people lose their faith in college, and it's because their faith is continuously attacked, and they're not even aware that there are easy answers to the challenges. Most of the challenges the kids are losing their faith over are over things that if they just Googled it, they would have found there was an answer. So, um, but the answers aren't having to on a platter. You have to seek them out. So there is a spiritual war going on, and uh, we do need to defend the faith, which is what apologetics is about. And there's, in, in, like in anything we do, there's an offense and defense. You know, if you're going to play soccer, there's an offense and a defense. If you're fighting a war, there's an offense and a defense. And so, in terms of our defense, we defend our faith by showing evidence that supports biblical theses. For example, perfect creation or a literal fall. Believe it or not, I think we have evidences from those things, scientific evidences. But actually, at some point, a person comes to the place, I came to a place, although God has, in his mercy, given us evidences, I believe the Bible because it's the word of God and it's a revelation from God. So if you take away all my scientific arguments, at this point I would still say, I believe Genesis 1 through 11 because it's God's words and it's foundational to the rest of scripture, including the gospel of the cross. But, um, and so apologetics never supersedes faith. It's about, apologetics is a way to help people so they don't stumble in their faith by, by things that aren't even accurate. And so apologetics is a way to rescue the majority of Christian students who are being persuaded not to believe because it's, they're told it's uh, irrational. So there's evidence for up here, and then there's evidence against, that is evidence against the, the biblical antithesis. antithesis. Uh, there are false Christian teachers, and so we need to make, protect against that. Islam is a major threat to Christianity. Islam is probably already the largest religious um, group portion of the, of the world, depending on who's counting. But Islam has a, both a <coughs> theological argument against Christianity, denying Christ and his divinity on the cross, but they also are a physical, Christians are being persecuted by radicals, Muslims all over the world. And so we need uh, to respond to Islam. We need to respond to what I call personal spirituality, or what traditionally has been called the New Age spirituality. This thing, whatever we call it, the new spirituality, is a bigger threat to the church than is Darwin. In the Western world, a much bigger threat than Islam. Do you have an answer for your aunt who's practicing witchcraft, or your cousin who's uh, who thinks that God is within them and that they are becoming God. Do you have an answer? We, we see we need to. So apologetics is important. Even if my perspective on creation and evolution is wrong, I want to be a really encourage you all to learn to defend your faith. Because the world isn't like a safe little Christian community. And, you, and, and we can't shine our light if we don't have answers for people's questions. I've heard it said, apologetics is loving people enough to give them solid answers for, good, for hard questions. Okay, that's my pep talk on apologetics. Um, today we're going to examine four things uh, that I've been studying in great depth and that have major impact on the creation evolution story. First is the fossil record. The second is biological information and its origin. The third is genetic entropy. And the fourth is evidence for Adam and Eve. And so, uh, we're going to start, obviously I'm going to emphasize genetic entropy, that's the thing I've been working on for 15 years, and have published many papers on. This I have some papers on, this I'm about to publish a book on with a colleague, and this, a little further down the road, will be a book. Um, so, 
one of the differences between myself and other, most other creationists is I'm not just an advocate for a position, I'm deeply involved in original research, which I publish, which often I can get published in secular journals. So that gives me a certain credibility uh, in terms of defending scripture. Okay, uh, to begin with fossil record, I'm just going to be like super short on this. Uh, but, you know, my genetic evidence is show that apes cannot evolve into people for many genetic reasons. But then people say, well, you're obviously wrong because the fossil record is very clear and we can see a smooth transition from apes to people. And so when I look, originally looked at the evidence for that, at, you know, like textbook level, I thought, yeah, that's really persuasive. Uh, and because of that, <coughs> thank you very much. A disaster waiting to happen. Um, so we've looked in detail at Tiktaalik. Some of you know what Tiktaalik is. It's the creature that crawled, the fish that crawled out, up under land. Uh, the whale's evolution story and human evolution. Uh, this we have a technical paper on. This one is a technical paper, which we post at this website, logosarea.org. Uh, what what boils down to is Tiktaalik is a bottom-dwelling fish, and there's no evidence that it ever walked out of the water. Uh, whale evolution story. Uh, doesn't hold up the creatures. The most of the transitional forms are actually land animals. And, uh, and so those are things you can read about. But that's, we've studied them and we're persuaded that that is true. But this one is the one I'd like to just briefly expand upon just a little bit. Uh, this is the book that we're almost ready to publish. It's called Contested Bones. And what we find is we've studied for four years the hominin literature. Hominin means the transitional forms between ape and man. Is that all the bones are contested. People in the field of paleoanthropology don't agree that Lucy walked upright, don't agree that Artie walked upright, don't agree that there is a species such as Homo habilis, which is the bone fragments. Uh, in fact, all of the major hominin fossils that are claimed to be transitional forms are contested within the field, and when critically examined, do not show what people claim they show. So just briefly, um, I'm just, this is just a cartoon really, but uh, you've seen the ape parade and uh, the monkey that just stands up, basically, just got taller and stood up. That's an easy transition, right? But of course, the transition is actually going from uh, a creature that, whose main skills are climbing trees and eating bananas to a creature that can uh, fly to the moon and back, and, and who can write music and has a soul and can know God. So there's something more than just getting an ape to stand upright. So these intermediate forms are called hominin, or hominin fossils, and this is the sequence that's normally taught. And what we find when we look at this in careful, after four years of research, what we find is that um, the big picture is that there are only two distinct groupings. You know, we feel that species are minutiae, they're just screwing here. Genera is the issue. There are only two genera of interest in the homing fossil uh, assembly. Uh, the first genera is called homo, and it is Latin for human or man. And the second genera is Australopithecus, which is Latin for southern native. We totally endorse the names and their meaning. So what we see is they're basically different types of strelopithecines, strelopiths, and they're different types of men, but there are no ape men that we can see in the fossil record. And it turns out that when you actually look at the dates on these things, humans and strelopiths coexisted through most of their existence, most of the time, most of the six million years that supposedly apes evolved into men. That's a problem because progenitors should not be living side by side with the, uh, with the ancestor. But these are found with their same bones in the same bone bed <coughs> at numerous sites. So they clearly coexisted. It appears that this uh, 
type of creature, a human, ate these ape-like creatures. And so they find some of these bones, lots of these bones, and these bones show evidence of being butchered with, with tools, like stone tools. So um, they coexisted, uh, and we see evidence of genetic degeneration, which could be a main thesis tonight. Things degrade over time due to mutations. We see evidence of man, where man looks like he is in a diseased state. For example, what's called Homo erectus looks like man that's suffered from inbreeding and genetic disease. And so we think that's a better explanation than saying that the Homo erectus is an intermediate between ape and man. And lastly, we find that the dating methods are uh, all over the place, and that people choose dates based upon pre pre Anyway, that's, a, that's an overview of human evolution, but uh, the book will come out in two or three months. Maybe I'll come back and talk to you then if you still want to listen to me. Um, so here's, the, here's uh, closer to the meat of what, the, that was the non-genetic part of my talk. The rest is going to be genetics. Um, biological information. Uh, Life is programmed. More and more geneticists and computer scientists who study these things are concluding life is programmed. And every aspect of our physiology, anatomy, and brain function is programmed. And that the genome, every gene is a program. And every RNA molecule is carrying information. And every protein is holding up is a algorithm. And so it's all about pure science. And so the bottom line is that information is what makes life alive. <coughs> you can take all the stuff that makes up life, DNA, RNA, protein, lipids, and whatever else you want to add to the gamish, it won't come on life unless there's information present. And the information encodes, it's like a cookbook. It tells life how to be life. And uh, information and IT are the only, we know that information and IT only come from intelligence. Ask a computer scientist if they're aware of any program that ever wrote itself or rose by trial and error. And you will quickly be told that is totally impossible. That you could, doesn't matter how long you wait, it will never happen. And we're actually going to be doing some research mutating programs, computer programs, to show that doesn't happen. Basically, it causes a computer program to degrade. If you change zeros and ones, in the machine language of a program, it will always degrade. Um, so information comes from intelligence. It's our universal experience. Therefore, when we find that the cell is packed with information, more sophisticated information than is on the internet, then we have evidence of intelligent design, compelling genetic evidence. And lastly, information cannot, well, I just said that. Okay. That's, that's the thesis. That's what that symposium was about. Um, that's what that symposium was about. Biological information and perspectives is published by World Scientific, which is a well-respected uh, scientific publisher. Um, and the people who contributed to it all basically 